saying before to somebody else that um, this is the graveyard shift. It's always difficult to follow a good speaker, particularly somebody like David Burke. He was pretty impressive, wasn't he? And he stole my thunder, so I'll get him one day. <laughs> First up, how I'm going to arrange this is that the first half of the talk will be going over the major aspects of Parkinson's disease, some of which have been spoken about already. So it'll give me an ideal opportunity to test you and see which ones have been paying attention. The other thing to notice is as you go through, you'll see a particular spelling mistake I just noticed last night. And it's not there, it's in the spelling of Dinepazil. I think the secretary might have spelt it Dinezepil, which is a completely different drug. In fact, that doesn't exist. So you may need to change that when you get your particular slides sent to you. Basic information. Um, for many years, it was just considered as a motor disorder. Over the last 20 or 25 years, Parkinson's disease has been recognized to be at least 40% a cognitive disorder as well. BPSD. I'll tell you a little story about that. Um, as you know, it's an acronym for Behavioural and Psychological Symptoms. A colleague of mine, who will remain nameless, was rung by his registrar one day, and he had no experience of old age psychiatry. And he heard what the registrar was saying. He said, oh, what, they've got BPSD. Okay, I'll be in soon and I'll chart some lithium for them. He thought that he was talking about bipolar affective mood disorder. He'd never heard of BPSD. It's not such a crazy story. There are many people who get acronyms mixed up. The reason why I'm making this story is that try not to use acronyms. Actually use the words instead. It causes a lot less confusion. Okay, we've been over the major features of Parkinson's disease today. The resting tremor, the muscle rigidity, uh, the throat and muscle so if the face get very weak. Nobody has mentioned today that um, a lot of people with Parkinson's disease not only have a mask-like face, but they have a very soft voice. Mm -hmm. And it fades and fades as they speak to you and as the years go on. Um, we've mentioned about the, uh, the drooling and the difficulty in swallowing. Um, the cognitive functions which are characteristically aff affected, difficulty in memory, impairment and planning and making sound judgment. I'll throw us a spot question to all of you now. How important do you think that difficulty in memory is in diagnosing Parkinson's disease? If I'd asked you that question maybe 10 or 15 years ago, you would have said extremely important. In fact, it's central. But times have changed. Yeah, we'll move on and I'll explain that in more detail. Motor abnormality, which we've spoken about before, the stooped posture, difficulty in turning, and small shuffling steps. Now, when I was speaking about 10 or 15 years ago, there's this horrible thing called a DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders. DSM-4 has recently been replaced by DSM-5. Now, it's not actually uh, rich in validity. A group of really smart people have got together and decided how psychiatry should be divided up. And it's really helpful in terms of communication, but it doesn't actually get anywhere near to the truth. In DSM-4, a central um, necessity is that of memory impairment. And then you need to have one or more of those uh, features. Aphasia, difficulty in language, apraxia, difficulty in motor functions, uh, agnosia, difficulty in, in recognizing things, and obviously the disturbance in executive functioning. What we used to say was that those two criteria, if they're present, they had to cause significant social and occupational deterioration, and it had to be tangible. In addition, there couldn't be any other physiological cause of the person's dementia, um, there didn't need to be any delirium that was present. DSM-5, on the other hand, is far more realistic. It's possible for a person with frontal temporal uh, dementia, for a person with 
Parkinson's type dementia not to have too much memory dysfunction. They may have a little bit of difficulty in short-term retention. They may have some confusion about learning new material, but no more than many other people in this age group might have. So memory impairment is important, but they're the, the more important issues. Mild or major neurocognitive disorder. The term neurocognitive disorder has replaced to a large extent the term dementia, unless you're specifically speaking about Alzheimer's dementia. Disturbing, if it's in Parkinson's disease, there needs to be an established illness already present. There has to be an insidious onset over time, usually over about 12 to 18 months, and there needs to be a gradual impairment, not sudden. We'll come to that later on when we speak about Lou body dementia. The final thing is that the neurocognitive disorder is not attributable to another medical condition. Now, these are the two distilled diagnostic criteria from DSM-5. Number one, there's no evidence of any mixed etiology. Number two, the PD clearly precedes the onset of the neurocognitive disorder. If one and two are present, then major or mild neurocognitive disorder, probably due to Parkinson's disease, can be diagnosed. If one or two is present, major or mild neurocognitive disorder can be diagnosed, possibly. And obviously, over time, that possibly becomes probably. So, before we go into this, can you see the difference? Because it's starting to look not only at Parkinson's disease, but dementia as a whole along a spectrum. It's possible to not only have a condition which is mild to moderate, but might actually include other kinds of neurocognitive disorders, whereas DSM-4 was focused on causology and type diagnosis, and very often excluded a lot of diagnostic um, syndromes. Okay, we've spoken a lot about um, epidemiology today, and I couldn't help but notice that the figures keep varying depending <laughs> on who the speaker actually is. Um, so I've, I've been fairly generous. Uh, um, <laughs> Parkinson's disease, it affects between one and two of the per thousand of the population at any one time. And I think that's fairly established. So it's about 0.1 to 0.2 percent. That's of the whole population from zero through to 100. Um, the prevalence of major or mild disorder due to PD is 75%. So if you have a major neurocognitive disorder due to Parkinson's disease, there's a 75% chance um, of having a well-developed condition which is not confused with something which is merely a short-term learning problem. 25% have a mild neurocognitive disorder. Now that figure of 75% is really important because you might have noticed that when David gave his presentation, he had the figure of 40%. At least one of the other speakers had it near to 60%. The reality is that about 60% of people with Parkinson's disease will have a definite diagnosis of dementia. About 75% have got a major neurocognitive dis disorder within which there will be those people with well-defined dementia. So it's an important distinction because of those 15% who have not yet got dementia, they may well develop as over time. Am I still coherent? Good. Okay. Prevalence increases with age, um, 65 to 69, 0.5 percent. 85, 3 percent. It's more common in males than females. And again, one of the previous speakers gave a lower figure. That figure was near to 1.2 to 1. The papers I've looked at is about 1.5 to 1, but you take your pick. Um, one thing which hasn't been mentioned in most of the papers I've read, and nobody's mentioned it to do today, and it's particularly significant in New Zealand, is the ethnic breakdown. Has anybody got an idea what the, the ratio of how many people uh, within the population have uh, dementia who may have a Maori background compared to Pakia? Would you hazard a guess? There's not very much work done on it. Yeah, it's about half. Uh, Maori is about one half 
50% less likely to develop a condition. It's a bit higher on Pacific Islanders. If you go to the UK or go to um, America, Afro-Americans again have about um, half the likelihood of developing dementia. Two hands. Is that corrected for age? Yeah. No, it's not. That was my next statement. That's my next statement. Yeah. So maybe it's a statistical anomaly. Sorry. Yeah, okay. There's the differential diagnosis of Lewy body uh, dementia, most of which we've spoken about today. Um, again, the two conditions, they lie on a spectrum. Um, you will notice in um, Alzheimer's condition, there is a loss of cholinergic producing neurons. And in individuals who are unfortunate enough to um, have Parkinson's disease, there's a dopamine um, deficiency. Uh, now, in Lewy body, you get both. And that's why it can mimic either condition very easily. The main difference is that um, Alzheimer's tends to be a gradual condition. Parkinson's disease will be gradual. Lewy body, the onset very often is quite sudden. Um, does anybody here have access to Sky? Do you remember seeing a program about five years ago called Boss? It used to be on late at night. And it was based on a true story about an American politician who developed somebody's seen it, who developed Lewy body dementia. Nobody knows this. There wasn't any difference in the behavior because for times he would be lucid and at other times he'd be quite crazy. At times he would see things and would respond to them and people thought this was really good. He was a very colorful politician. It's only when they had, they had very, very confused periods he started to develop hypotension and other physical symptoms of the condition that it was clear he needed treatment. If you develop Lewy body dementia and it's properly diagnosed, um, the, the actual time from diagnosis through to death, you're looking at less than 15 months very often. Um, that's not the case with either Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. Did you enjoy that program, by the way? It was. Yeah, it was about two years before a certain politician was elected in America. That was what was really frightening. <laughs> so here we go. Lewy body progresses more quickly than Alzheimer's. Uh, it's distinguished by the, the dementia sometimes occur PD and by the time frame. If you have an individual um, who, who you see in your surgery or in some form of uh, consultation room and the person has most of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease and they also have memory difficulties, um, what do you think the likely diagnosis is going to be? The answer is there. Lewy body dementia is diagnosed when cognitive symptoms begin at the same time or within a year of the Parkinsonian most of the symptoms. If somebody may actually have Parkinson's disease and there's no major significant change in the cognition for maybe 15 or 18 months, then it's de dementia secondary to Parkinson's disease. It's a really important distinguishing point is the treatment modalities are quite different. Okay, moving on to behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. In the, the work I've read, um, the authors try to separate out behavior from psychosis and depression. It's probably a silly um, demarcation because they're mixed in the whole time. Um, you'll find that on the next slide, and a few people have alluded to this already, but how many people uh, do you think with Parkinson's disease actually get depressed? Lots. Lots, yep, it's a good start. <laughs> but a figure, what would you say? It's been. Yeah, it depends what you're going to look at. It's around 50%, something like that. Um, a few words about depression. Um, most of you will know that years ago we used to speak in terms of so called neurotic depression as opposed to major depression or. Uh, endogenous depression. People with endogenous depression were supposed to have something wrong with their DNA and they would have low levels of 5-hydroxytryptamine. They may have had parents who were depressed. They were constitutionally predisposed to becoming depressed as opposed to nice normal people who'd been exposed to terrible trauma and as a result became depressed. The truth is somewhere between the two. If anybody is exposed to enough stress in their life, they will become depressed biochemically. Um, people who have a biological tendency towards depression 
will become depressed also. Do you know what the overall prevalence of depression is in the community, generally? 20%, somebody says, oh right, about 17 to 20%. Now, these are individuals who may or may not have an endogenous tendency or been exposed to lots of stress factors. As one of the speakers said earlier on, Parkinson's disease is both. If you've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, that's a major life event which is going to get you down. Um, in addition, there's a dysregulation of the serotonin system, which leads to low levels of 5-hydroxytryptamine. Therefore, you're going to need treatment of some form. So, as an aside, is it the same as head injuries? Head injuries obviously quite a major event, but they seem to have a really high incidence. Yes, yes, it is. It's very similar pathology. In terms of the biochemical breakdown, not only in the serotonin system, but in the dopamine system as well. I guess the complication in head injuries is very often there will be frontal temporal involvement as well, which leads to disinhibition. That's a totally different story. Um, we may come on to that later on when I speak about some of the antidepressants. Okay, depression. 50% um, of people with Parkinson's disease are depressed. It doesn't always follow um, Parkinson's disease. There's a very interesting statistical anomaly. Um, overall, people who receive antidepressants are more likely to develop Parkinson's disease. Uh, some of the smart Alex therefore thought that, oh yes, antidepressants cause Parkinson's disease, but in case it's, it's not the case, because very often a person will have a, a long period of depression before Parkinson's disease symptoms manifest themselves and they have been placed on antidepressant by their GP and then later on develop full motor symptoms of PD. Now, have any of you seen individuals who have hallucinations within the setting of Parkinson's disease, of course? Yeah? Anybody else? Yeah, nearly all of you actually. Um, I remember seeing a person on the medical ward about three years ago um, who was sitting up and I interviewed him because the, the physician wanted advice uh, with regards to medication and he was, had a benign expression on his face and was talking to me but every now and again would turn to look at the foot of his bed. I said, what do you think? And I would turn slowly to look. I wasn't too sure if there was a nurse standing there or not. He had little children at the foot of his bed that he could see. And the difference between these kind of hallucinations and the ones that you might see in schizophrenia, for example, that these are usually benign. Person, this person is not bothered by them particularly. Um, if they are, then it might be a suspicion that there's an underlying schizophrenia, or the person may have more of a Lewy body type of dementia. So Parkinsonian hallucinations are usually benign. Um, it's very rare to have auditory hallucinations in Parkinson's disease unless they are associated with visual hallucinations. Would anybody like to um, offer a definition of what a hallucination is? Yeah. Well, it's quite simply, it's, it's a sensation without stimulus. You know, so if none of you are here and I see you, then I'm hallucinating. Although, who's going to prove that one way or the other? <laughs> and that's the rub, because the particular chap I saw in the medical ward actually spoke to him about the hallucinations. I said, oh, well, I know they're not really there. They just keep me company. They were not part of a fixed, false, delusional system, impervious to reason and out of context with this culture. That's the definition of a delusion. It was more like an as-if feeling as they were taking too much pot or somebody had given them bad asset. So I know it's not real, but they're quite pleasant company for the time being. When the person is deluded, very often they're of spousal infidelity, and you would have seen this, it's been mentioned earlier on. Um, other themes might be that people are out to steal from them, to harm them, to place poison in the food, and God forbid even crush up their medication and sprinkle it all on the food. It's not a delusion, it's real in that situation. Um, and as somebody mentioned before, it's not uncommon the patients will call us emergency services. The figure I've come up with the correlation between psychosis and Parkinson's disease at about 40%. I suspect it might be a little higher than that. 
Um, in the early stages, the person very often retains their insight. But maybe over two years, two and a half years, the insight might start to go away. And that usually uh, coincides with deterioration in cognition as well. All right, in terms of management, as David was suggesting before, if the hallucinations are mild and benign, don't go charging you with antipsychotics. What's the point? Uh, because you, you may actually cause more Parkinsonian side effects. So just leave as is. If the patient is experiencing more threatening paranoid ideas, then you may need to think about pharmacological interventions. Rule out any reversible causes. Uh, decrease and discontinue any adjunctive anti-Parkinsonian drugs. So you wouldn't be looking at L-DOPA or um, the usual preparations you were given in more severe cases of Parkinson's disease. But cogentin, um, or procyclidine as David prefers, they could be gradually reduced over time. I usually give a reduction schedule of over five to seven days um, to give the person plenty of time to adjust to the change. Last paragraph, if the patient is on several medications, reduce one drug at a time until the psychosis resolves. Simplify the regime. Maybe add a new or second generation antipsychotic. Again, David was speaking about quetiapine, which is fine. Um, the trouble is, it's difficult to get a really very good antipsychotic effect from quetiapine in low doses. Quetiapine has taken over as the new melaro, you know, and it's, you, you will know it as it's prescribed in lower doses. It has a mild sedative effect if you give 12.5 to uh, 30 milligrams a day, but it's not actually working as an antipsychotic. Um, I, I use uh, quetiapine in the treatment of people with core schizophrenia. Well, what sort of dose do you think is needed for core schizophrenia? Sorry? Try again. 600. Yeah. For somebody who's got um, uh, first rank symptoms of schizophrenia, you're looking at a dose between four and 600 milligrams a day. And provided they can tolerate the side effects, which usually they can, then the psychosis will go away. Giving 12.5 milligrams is probably not going to shift the psychosis. It will minimize the suffering and diminish agitation, but that's about all. Um, other drugs which are used, we'll speak about later, are risperidone, olanzapine, and one or two others. David did make a very good point about the use of um, um, river sigmi and denepazil. Uh, they are very useful sometimes in the treatment of um, psychotic symptoms. I don't know why. There isn't any logical reason. It may have something to do with them. Um, the upset in the dopamine system, which occurs in Parkinson's disease, but I haven't been able to find any consistent rationale. So there's the summary of the first half of the talk. Um, Parkinson's disease is progressive. Um, the symptoms have been repeated ad nauseum today. Up to 6% will develop dementia, 50% will develop depression, um, and in some individuals, the depression precedes other symptoms of the disorder and a significant percentage, 40%, develop psychosis. So I'll pause there, and we can just um, throw it open. But who knows the difference between anxiety and agitation? We've spoken a lot about those two conditions today, and they've been interchangeable, but they're not the same. Agitation and physical manifestation, that you can see, yeah. physical resistance. Yeah, somebody can be very anxious about Absolutely, yeah. That's it. And anxiety. What, what do people think anxiety is? Fear. Mm -hmm. I just heard somebody mumble. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a subjective feeling, isn't it? It's a subjective feeling of dread, apprehension. Some people have described it as fear spread thin. And I think that's a really good description. Usually, people who are anxious get a bit agitated as well. 
and that's difficult for somebody with Parkinson's disease if they're already shaking. Um, but you can notice things such as staccato speech, uh, rapid movements of the eyes around the room, and overall nervousness, sweating too much, all of those kind of symptoms. You're making a very good point. It's possible for some to, somebody to be extremely anxious, um, as I am right now, but not appearing to be at all agitated, I hope. <laughs> and vice versa is also true as well. Okay, let's move on. So these are some of the medications which are commonly used in BPSD. Antipsychotics. <coughs> And you'll know that most of the antipsychotics have some form of Parkinsonian side effects. And you'll also know that most of the Parkinsonian drugs have impacts on people's delusional system, hallucinations, and mood. So you will have heard about this before. It's a question of getting the balance right. Now, patients with Lewy body dementia have increased sensitivity to typical and atypical antipsychotics especially risperidone, and that can cause the neuroleptic malignant sy syndrome that David spoke about before. In fact, people with Lewy body dementia are sensitive to nearly all of the antipsychotics. Um, I mentioned to Jan when I was speaking to her last night that um, I'm, I'm aware of an individual who will remain nameless, um, who was very tired one night and received a call from the junior doctor. Uh, there was an elderly lady with some form of dementia, and it hadn't been diagnosed which one. And he suggested that the person who was acting out with BPSD uh, should have a low dose of clopixol acuphase. The patient died three days later with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. She had Lewy body dementia, and it hadn't been properly diagnosed. Okay. Now, when you get your slides sent out to you, um, you may want to include quetiapine on that list as well. Um, but with the rider, that's if you're going to prescribe quetiapine, try and get it up to about 50 or 62.5 milligrams in a day if the patient can tolerate it. That's when it will have more of an antipsychotic effect. Risperidone is very good and it's recommended in New Zealand for the treatment of BPSD. Um, Alanzapine is quite good, but the trouble is it's associated with the metabolic syndrome, which you've probably heard of before, um, and particularly in the elderly, where you have raised lipids, high blood pressure, raised glucose, and weight increase. So it's a bit risky to be giving an individual alanzapine, unless they have a past history of bipolar disorder, and they have developed Parkinson's disease as well. A low dose of alanzapine is very useful in the management of bipolar disorder. This, both of those drugs cause fairly serious adverse cardiovascular effects and EPS. If you're going to use risperidone, you can probably get away with 1.25 milligrams in 24 hours, but no more than that. Any more than that, then you are going to get significant EPS symptoms. Does anybody still use conventional antipsychotics or even remember what they are? I had to really strain to think what they used to be. Uh, chlorpromazine, uh, malaryl, uh, stelazine, trifluperazine, in the really old days, modicus, flufenazine, flupenthixol. Yeah. They're hardly used these days. Um, do you know what the, the, the main problem is in using a drug like chlorpromazine? What would you think? That's, yeah, you do get that. Yeah, um, Sedation, yeah, that's two. There's, there's two other ones. You can sometimes get liver difficulties. Uh, it's usual to check a person's LFTs before you give them chlorpromazine. But the big one is hypotension. Um, I actually, when I first started psychiatry in, in Britain in the mid 70s, I remember somebody who was actually given 100 milligrams of chlorpromazine. This lady was six foot three and weighed 20 stone. She had a hypotensive attack, fell backwards, and got a subdural hematoma. So it's quite a risky drug to give chlorpromazine, um, particularly for somebody with Parkinson's disease. Key thing is, if you're forced to use this, as somebody has already prescribed it, the greatest risk occurs immediately after therapy, within 72 hours, and with higher doses. So try to use low doses of these drugs. Um, they're at least as likely to increase the risk of death amongst elderly people. 
You could actually go through all of this and the bottom line would be don't use conventional antipsychotics. Stick to risperidone, alanzapine and quetiapin. Anticonvulsants. These were touched on by uh, David in his talk. Um, carbamazepine I like. It's quite a useful drug um, in certain situations where a person is really acting out quite badly. The only trouble with this drug, as some of you might know, it's an enzyme inducer, and so it can actually reduce the efficacy of other drugs which might be being prescribed simultaneously. If you're going to give carbamazepine, the dose that you're looking for is usually between two and 400 milligrams a day. Um, sodium valparaise is quite useful as well. There isn't any scientific rationale for using sodium valparaise. It doesn't have any particular effects within the relevant parts of the brain. You're simply making use of its sedative qualities. Um, I don't use gabapentin. I've got some concerns about it, but I know that some psychiatrists like to use this in doses of between three and 600 milligrams a day. Um, what I've found with gabapentin is that there is a degree of not so much dependence but tolerance and the person needs higher doses over time. Antidepressants. Um, now the jury is out on this and I was observing David's comments. Um, I think the best antidepressant uh, to be used in assessing your BPSD is mirtazapine without a doubt, um, for a number of reasons. Um, one is, it's one of the few um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors which doesn't cause hyponatremia. Most of the um, SSRIs will cause a significant hyponatremia. And if you've got somebody who may have disturbed sodium and potassium and are hanging on to a level of about 128, 129, you will lower it down to 124, 125 would become dangerous. That happens less with metazapine. The second thing about metazapine is it's really interesting in its biochemical structure. Sure enough, it's, a, it's an SSRI, but it also has an effect on the noradrenergic system, and it has mild antihistamine properties as well. So you're really hitting a number of birds with one stone. Just going back to a comment you made earlier on, it's really useful for sleep. Now, there's a, a bit of irony with metazapine because if you prescribe 15 milligrams, that's half a tablet, it has largely a sedative effect. The person will feel quite chilled very quickly. If you increase the dose up to 30 milligrams, the noradrenergic effects start to cut in and the person will start to get quite lively. So be careful about the dose that you're prescribing. Um, citalopram. Um, is very selective and it's purely an SSRI and nothing more. The only difficulty is in some people it can induce anxiety rather than reduce it and it definitely will cause a degree of hyponatremia. Trazodone is an excellent drug which unfortunately is not available here. I've had one or two people who come over from the UK in the last few years and were on Trazodone. It uh, hasn't got too many side effects. Um, causes mild sedation, no anticholinergic effect. It really is a very good drug, but unless the patient wants to buy it in, you won't be able to get it in New Zealand at the current time. So can I ask something? Yeah, sure. The, I understood that we have to be really careful with the higher doses in the other. Would it be, can you still get 40 milligrams or only 20? No, I tend to shy away from 40 milligrams. If a um, person's not responding on 20, unless they've got a, a proven history of major depression, it's a different ball game altogether. But if it's just, it's just purely for BPSD, at the higher doses, it has a similar effect that fluoxetine used to have years ago. It will actually cause mild agitation, defeats the whole point of the exercise. You're far better actually to maybe combine a low dose of citalopram and augment it uh, with a low dose of another medication such as metazapine. Okay. Lewy body dementia, um, denepozil can be used uh, to reduce behavioral symptoms. Rivastigmine is not bad, but the trouble is, you know, you have to apply it with a patch, and it's a bit more difficult to control the serum levels. 
Um, David mentioned memantine before. That can be given as an adjunct um, to denepazil. Uh, beta blockers um, like propranolol can be used, but there is one particular side effect which has come forward over the last three or four years with regards to propranolol and metoprolol. Do you know what it is? About 3% of people who take those particular beta blockers. Visual hallucinations. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I saw a lady in clinic about uh, six months ago who the GP thought had Lewy body dementia and I noticed that she was taking um, just under 100 milligrams of metoprolol each day. We gradually reduced this and over the next two months the visual hallucinations went away and her cognition actually improved. So it's something to bear in mind. What was she taking the propranolol for? Uh, she had arrhythmias, yeah, which were minimal anyway. She had arrhythmias most of her life. Um, buspirone is a really uh, very nice drug. Um, it's an antidepressant uh, which is given for the treatment of uh, depression mixed with anxiety, and it's quite useful in the elderly. Uh, the usual dose would be about 25 milligrams twice a day. Now, I'm contradicting myself here because I've said low dose of propranolol may reduce disruptive or aggressive behavior, provided the person's not prone to visual hallucinations, that is. And finally, benzodiazepines. Um, whenever you say the word benzodiazepine to anybody, you'll get the sign straight away, don't go there. In fact, they're okay, they're fine. You know, if you prescribe them in low doses and you monitor on a regular basis, the best clinical practice guidelines show that if somebody has really very marked behavioral difficulties, you can use a low dose of something like clonazepam or lorazepam, um, provided it's reviewed after four weeks and the intention is always to reduce the medication as quickly as you can. The other thing is, if you're not prescribing a dose which is too high, the chances of the, per the person developing tolerance of becoming dependent is relatively low. So you might give a dose of an um, clonazepam maybe 0.25 milligrams twice a day. That's going to be quite safe. The danger is if the person has an underlying personality disorder or addictive in nature, that's when you run into difficulties. Still coherent? Good. So here's some conclusions. Um, BPSD, they occur in most dementing conditions. One half experience psychotic symptoms. We haven't mentioned this, but caregiver education, support, behavioral training, and environmental modifications should be the first step. But that will be the subject of a whole new talk. Mm -hmm. Good clinical practice dictates that patients receive individualized dosing regimes initiated and modified relative to clinical efficacy and targeted to specific neuropsychiatric symptoms. If you just look at those last four or five words, that's crucial to what I'm trying to say. In P BPSD associated with uh, Parkinson's disease or any kind of dementing condition, you're not treating an illness. You may be not even treating a syndrome. You are targeting certain behaviors. And as Jan said earlier on, you are taking advantage of certain side effects of potent medications to diminish that person's aberrant behavior. But just try to remember you're not treating an illness as such. And the final take home message, if some of you want to look up this person on the net, Gauthier, who's the god when it comes to uh, dementia and the treatment of dementia, the art of drug treatment is to use the right drug for the right symptoms at the proper stage of the disease, starting low and going slow. Thanks very much.